First Samuel 25 is a very unique story. It's kind of a standalone story in the whole sweep of our study of First Samuel. Nothing really leads into the story and nothing really leads out of the story. You know, David's in the wilderness. That's true to the context of 1 Samuel. But most other elements of the story are their own unique thing. What's going on here? Well, if you were a native Hebrew speaker, you'd be clued in pretty soon. Verse 3 with the introduction of one of the main characters of the story, it was some guy whose name was Nabal. Right away, if you were a native Hebrew speaker, you would be clued in that Nabal means fool, fool. So yes, yeah, for those of you who are into naming your pets or your children or you're going on name berry to find the meanings of what you want to name your child, yeah, don't, I'd steer clear of Nabal, okay? It literally means fool. So then you might say, what parent would name their child Nabal? And the answer is no parent. There is no parent. You know, or what prospective spouse would say, oh, I've got a match, and the person's name is Nabal? <laughs> no. Native Hebrew speakers would be immediately clued in and cautioned, Nabal. They would think, all right, sit back, pop some popcorn. This ought to be interesting. Nabal. Seriously. So the story introduced Nabal, and the story introduces who else? Abigail. Abigail. Then provides us with a few more details. Nabal, fool, happens to be not just rich, but very rich. And then it goes on to say that Nabal, fool, rich, very rich. Let's add some more details to that. Well, he's got thousands of sheep and a thousand goats. He's got property. You get the picture. Nabal, very prosperous. And then the story adds a few more details. He was mean-spirited. He was a despicable fellow. That's in the CEB translation. He's terrible. He's a jerk. Meanwhile, he happens to be married to Abigail, who's described as intelligent and attractive. So here we go. We're off to the races. The context for the story is this thing, previously unknown to us Bible readers, as shearing day. Shearing day. So we imagine with all those thousands of sheep that Nabal had, they needed to be sheared every now and again. That was part of their wealth and riches, part of the uh, produce of their farm. And apparently, shearing day has a connotation of abundance and feasting. It's a party day. Maybe it's a day where ching ching, you know, you're going to go from very rich to maybe very, very rich that day. Your coffers would be full, the freezers overflowing, definitely a party day. And later, later in the story, we didn't read this part, Nabal is uh, pictured as eating like a king and a bit drunk. So he's ready to party. That's the connotation of shearing day. Well, I was thinking about this text, and I was thinking about David, and I was thinking, hey, it's Labor Day weekend, and you know, if you've been around the block with us a few times, you might know a thing or two about David's resume. 
Anybody know what David's first job was? What was his first job? Yeah, back in Bethlehem, he worked with the sheep. So don't you think he'd know about shearing and all that stuff and what goes on and the wealth that comes from shearing? David would know that. David had a second job. He was, remember the second job he had? I guess it'd be like this, plink, plink. What's that? Yeah, yeah, right. He played the lyre or a little harp. Yeah. So he had a job as a musician. And then when Saul, oh, yeah, and then he had another job. Uh, When the society was facing a giant problem, David rose, and do you remember what he did? Yeah, he had a slingshot and that took care of that giant with one smooth stone. I gotta watch that. So he also became a soldier. And we know he's also been anointed king. So David's a pretty famous guy. Currently, uh, you know, living as a soldier. But, um, but his background is a shepherd. So he knows all about sheep and shearing and shepherds. So King Saul is kind of like chased him out. So he has to live in the wilderness as a mercenary soldier, a good one. So he's living on the fringes of this Carmel uh, state, and he gets to know the shepherds. Of course he would. Of course he would. So David and the the soldiers uh, would be interacting with the shepherds out there in the fields. And apparently, we can kind of deduce that typically soldiers living in the wilderness had a bad reputation. Some of them do today, too. You know, um, let's name it the Wagner Group. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for such violent, horrid, evil, Nabal uh, moves. But David and his soldiers, not like that at all. So David and um, his soldiers were well-behaved. They were not thugs. They were not stealing food. Um, In fact, in one translation, the shepherds say of David and his um, soldier group, man, they're like a wall around us. They protected us and the sheep. So they were doing good in the hood. So David seemed to know the niceties around Sheep shearing day. He would have known it's a big day, it's a festival day, and the freezers would be overflowing. So David, our trusted person across 1 Samuel, he does what seems the normal cultural thing to do on a big feast day in such a situation. David models for a group of his soldiers, his helpers, Listen, there's a shearing day coming, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to make an approach to this neighbor whose land and shepherds and fields we've been there protecting, and we've been very ethical. We're going to make an approach and ask if they will share their feast and their largesse with us. So the story is very careful to model how David trains his helpers to go and talk to Nabal. Three times David models for them, say peace to you, we come in peace, we are all about peace, peace. David knows the drill for being a good neighbor. And then he says, you know, let them know who I am and then ask, we know it's a feast day, you know, it's kind of normal to share, would you do that? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So David ships out his helper soldiers, and they interact with Nabal. Does that go well? Not so much. So it wasn't just a refusal. It was really terrible. It was totally insulting. You know, after this introduction, this vulnerable sharing, we are with David, and this is who David is, and, you know, uh, thank you, sir. You know, we are neighbors. Nabal says, David, I've never heard of David. I've never heard of this person. Who's that? 
It's so rude. It's so insulting. He goes on, you're just a bunch of nobodies. Ah, who knows where you come from? I have no clue about you people. And then he says such an insulting thing. You know, I've been reading in the newspapers that there's these runaway slaves that are just taken off from properties. I bet you're some of those runaway slave people, aren't you? So rude. So insulting. So, and apparently, them's fighting words. Because when word gets back to David, it is so insulting that he straps on his sword and he signals to 400 other soldiers there with him in the wilderness, we got to take this guy on. This is, this is evil. So David's getting ready to go. But then, fortunately, and in many situations, fortunately, there was a diplomatic back channel. Someone overheard what was going on. Someone knew about Nabal. Someone understood the situation and got word to Abigail. Abigail listened, and she instantly believed the servant. Oh, what a disaster. And I love how the text says, Abigail did not go and consult with Nabal. You know, when you're working with a fool, sometimes you just got to, you know, forgiveness is easier than permission. It's a form of wisdom. Do not consult with a fool. Abigail rises to the occasion, believes, understands, takes action. It's so powerful to see all the action that Abigail takes. And and you think, you know, we have clues about what it was like for women in that society. So it's so interesting that, you know, she doesn't consult with Nabal. She just goes right ahead and she starts scooping up food lots and lots of food and goods, loads it up. She sends other servants ahead on the donkeys, brings the food out to David so David and the soldiers will see food's coming from that household, food's coming. And then Abigail herself loads up some more food, gets on a mule, and goes out to David herself. So she seeks David out face to face. When she finds him, she falls on the ground showing respect and says, you know what? Whatever just happened there, blame me. So sorry. That was so beyond the pale. So sorry. Please accept these gifts. And I love this line. It's 1 Samuel 25, 25. Abigail soothes David by saying, do not pay, do not take seriously, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow. How about if we practice saying that together? I'll say the first phrase and then you guys chime in and then I'll say the second part of that sentence and you chime in. So we'll do a listen and repeat. You ready? Do not take seriously. Do not take seriously. This ill-natured fellow. This ill-natured fellow. Isn't that a great line? So, what's up with this story? This funny story that's just dropped there at the end of First Samuel. Well, I marvel at Abigail. I was thinking, if I'm in a situation that is just so darn foolish, one of my reactions would be just to freeze. I'd be immobilized, like, oh, what to do? This is so ridiculous. Maybe here we go again. You know, I think she would see the pattern of how Nabal operates. How was she able to override a paralyzing sense of despair and what do you do? This is so terribly overwhelming. How did she get through that and act appropriately? Well, 
Interestingly, lately I've been doing extra reading and just randomly finding articles and studies about a human physiological response um, called freezing. So when we're in a terrible situation, fight, flight, whatever, being under attack, we, we've heard of fight or flight, there is a physiological response called freezing. And a lot more research has been done about this involuntary nervous system reaction called freezing. So to be human is to freeze in certain situations. We just can't help it. And there's been a lot out there uh, in the past that has judged people who have been under attack and they froze. Sometimes I judge myself in smaller instances. Something happens that is inappropriate, not great, and I freeze. So step one in this new understanding of psychology and how people function is destigmatizing, freezing. That's a normal human response when something terrible happens. Our bodies know it's danger, and it's a survival. It's a sensible survival tactic to freeze. So with this physiological, biological discovery, um, there's been more work done with police departments and court systems so that people have a better understanding of freezing when something terrible is happening, freezing. Also with this body of literature uh, about freezing, um, there's a couple other things that are kind of neat to know about this thing. First, destigmatizing freezing. We've all been, whether it's a small thing or a terribly large one, we might have experienced that in our lives. It's a thing, normalize, don't judge yourself. A next place to go, in addition to that, is healing from freezing. And a third place to go is how we move forward. Um, if we've experienced freezing, should we meet another situation where our bodies might help, might have us freeze and not be able to act? So that second place after destigmatizing freezing, the second place is healing. There's a wonderful form of healing. And I think Sally's on the spectrum of teaching about that healing. And I'm learning more and more about it. And I'll just use a loose, broad term called somatics. Soma is your body. And um, just a lot more studies have been done. And I hope to introduce some somatic things in the fall here. So in somatic healing, we realize, uh, as the, a famous book says, the body keeps score. Our body remembers when terrible things happen, when foolish things happen. And even though we might be able to function or whatever, our body is still a bit frozen. But fortunately, you know, with wisdom, intelligence, and practice, we have figured out how to unfreeze trauma or terrible things that happen. So there's interesting therapeutic techniques that help people revisit terrible things in a very, very, very safe way, and they, they're built up before they revisit the safe thing. And then there's things we can do with our bodies that help us imagine moving and not getting stuck in a trauma or a bad situation. So it's very, very healing. I took a um, class at Synod School that put these into practice. And uh, at, she walked us through a, a traumatic situation. It actually involved gun violence. And we talked about it. We debriefed about it. And then she led us through a somatic exercise where we imagined a goal of peace and beauty and healing that we were all headed toward. And at the end of the exercise, she had us row with our bodies toward the goal, a somatic 
exercise of healing. I thought that was so interesting to move past foolishness, a terrible thing. Well, beyond that healing, that kind of a thing leads to the third thing of readiness in case another attack or terrible thing happens. You're in a different place with whatever happened. You are in a fresh place and you um, have another sense of safety and your toolkit is different. And I even read an example of how someone who did come under a terrible attack did the discipline, walked through um, the healing steps, and then when something terrible happened again, she was able to respond a little bit better and thwart some terrible foolishness. So when, um, we, when we heal or do some things that get us thinking about bad things happen, foolish things happen, if we walk through it, we're in a better position to not be as frozen. We can act. We can intervene. That got me thinking about Abigail. Imagine living in a foolish dynamic every dang day of your life. Day in, day out, foolishness. That would be terribly depressing. That would be a normal response. And you might move into being frozen. What can you do? You might move into learned helplessness. Nothing we can do about this. Nothing we can do about this. A state of hopelessness. And that could have been Abigail, day in, day out, foolishness, foolishness. Somehow, Abigail took her terrible situation. I wonder if she kind of processed it. She mentions God in her speech to David. I wonder if the Holy Spirit had given her wisdom. And she learned somehow, maybe it was prayer or practices, that she could act, or that she could move through ridiculousness. And so she was able to push through and respond appropriately. Maybe many, many, many times she had been frozen, frozen, frozen. But in this instance, bam, the spirit led her, and she was able to act and fix a terrible, terrible situation. Maybe her terrible experience got redeemed, which happens all the time, friends. God redeems our terrible pasts, our terrible situations. Today, I'd like to practice again that statement. Maybe you've had an experience, or maybe today you are experiencing something that's kind of ridiculous. What was that phrase again? And I'll alter it just a little bit. Do not take seriously seriously. this ill-natured person. person. Do not take seriously seriously. this ill-natured person. When I thought about that statement, I thought of about six different people across the course of my life who have said that to me, different types of situations. And it was so healing to realize I had frozen that in my brain and someone else helped me heal, think through a difficult situation. So I I say to you, do not take seriously that ill-natured person for yourself. Now I'd like you to think about another person that you love who's worrying about something, maybe a person or situation. Think of that other person and let's practice saying this to that other person in our head. Think of someone you love who may be worrying about something. And now imagine yourself saying to this person, Do not take seriously seriously. this ill-natured person. person. I think that's the cross. 
The cross is telling us, do not take seriously the ill-natured parts of this old world. Do not take that seriously. There is so much goodness out there, goodness meant for you that God wants you to scoop up and take in no matter what. It is abundant. I think that's the message of this table. Do not take seriously stingy, mean people. Don't take it seriously. There is so much God wants to share with you and provide healing for and equip you so that you can be healed, you can have ideas about how you're going to act, and you can unfreeze. And you can intervene even for other people who are beat down by foolishness. So come today and be fed by a God of generosity. To God be the glory.